Alchem has spent decades perfecting the art of microencapsulation for both the human and animal nutrition segments. Add in food processing and nutrition expertise, and we have the complete package you need to overcome the formulation or production challenges that hinder innovation. Look to PetSure from Balchem to provide the expertise and capabilities that redefine entire product categories and help bring your imagined products to reality. Hello everyone, my name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem, and today we have a very unique webinar to share with you. We're introducing a new research showcase program and we'll feature three graduate students from K-State's pet food program. We will hear TED Talk style presentations featuring some of the newest research in the companion animal segment. I would now like to introduce Dr. Greg Aldrich and the Kansas State Pet Food Program. As you saw in the brief video we shared, the K-State Pet Food Program started in 2011 to provide an academic home for the emerging field of pet food and companion animal nutrition sciences. The research program focuses on characterizing the nutritional impact of modern pet food processing. Dr. Aldrich's program is also designed to foster new channels of teaching and exchange between the pet food industry and Kansas State. Our first presentation will be from Heather Acuff. Heather is a third year PhD student in grain science and industry at Kansas State University, where her research focuses on the impacts of modern pet food processing on companion animal nutrition. Heather holds a bachelor's degree in pre-veterinary science and a master's degree in monogastric nutrition from California State Polytechnic University. In addition to being a full-time student, Heather also works as a full-time product development manager for New Low Pet Food in Austin, Texas. During her five years with New Low, she's helped commercialize more than 200 pet foods, treats, and supplements. Heather, you should now have control of the screen. Wonderful. Thank you, Scott, for that very nice introduction and good morning, everyone. Today, I'm very honored to share with you some of the research that came out of my PhD program here at K-State regarding the use of bacillus coagulans, which is a probiotic in extruded pet food applications. So let's start with what are probiotics? The most current and widely used definition of probiotics was proposed by the World Health Organization, and that's live microorganisms that, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. Probiotics are one of many what are called functional ingredients that we use in pet food products, and these are really intended to offer some benefit to the animal that extend beyond just supplying nutrients. And these functional products are one of the key growth drivers in our pet food industry today, which I think the audience here is very well aware of. What I found really interesting when I started researching this topic is that the number of research publications available for humans has just grown exponentially over the last 30 years. But just like we, we hear this all the time that pet food trends mirror what's happening in the pet food industry, and probiotics are a really good example of that. On this graph here, the little tiny specks of yellow you can see along the bottom of the screen represent the number of publications available in dog. So even though we're using probiotics widespread in pet food products today, uh, we still need research to catch up and substantiate some of the claims we're making. For the benefits that have been reported in dogs, um, fortunately, there are quite a few uh, that have reported stool quality improvement and nutrient utilization, um, balancing their microflora. So there's a lot of good things that can come out of using probiotics for pets. However, what I wanted to point out here is that most of these benefits you see on the screen tend to be strain and dose specific. So that really warrants the need for validating new novel strains in the animal that you're intending them for, as well as for the specific activities and benefits they might offer. Before a probiotic can even offer a benefit to the animal, there are different challenges they face before they can uh, make it to the gastrointestinal tract where they can start to have those beneficial activities. And so what I wanted to point out here is that if you think about every stage of a probiotics journey from strain preparation all the way to the target site, each of those hurdles comes with its own set of challenges. 
And when we don't take that into consideration when choosing a probiotic for a specific application, that can be uh, lead to challenges in meeting guarantees for the viability claims on a pet food product. A good example of this is a study that came out of the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada, uh, where Scott Weiss and uh, Louis Arroyo had sampled, there were 19 products they pulled out of the local marketplace there. And they found that more than half of them were severely inadequate, not only with respect to the amount of probiotic surviving in the product at the time of sampling, but also with the, the strains that were present. Many of them did not have all of the strains that they were claiming on label. So that really sets up a good question of whether certain probiotics might be better suited than others to use in commercial pet food applications. When we look at the probiotics we have approved for use in pet foods, they have different physiological characteristics that can affect their ability to cope with different stresses they face. As an example, vegetative cells tend to be more susceptible to damage by heat. Um, they survive worse in cooking and shelf life, and they're also more susceptible to damage by exposure to gastric acid or bile salts in the digestive tract. Spores, on the other hand, are remarkably resistant to those types of stressors. They have inherent production in the layers that um, are built around them, and that in the fact that they're also in a metabolically dormant state at the time that they're ingested, as well as uh, all the way through processing. So that leads us to the probiotic we used in this research study, which was Bacillus coagulans GBI-30-6086, which is marketed under the trade name Ganeden BC-30. What we know about BC-30 is that this organism is safe for human consumption in very high doses. It's a spore former, and it has lots of other characteristics that make it a really good candidate for use in pet food applications. So we formed two broad research questions, and that was, one, will the organism survive the extrusion and drying of pet food products? And second, would it offer some gastrointestinal health benefits to dogs? And if so, at what dose? So to answer the first question, we inoculated a pet food-based ration with the probiotic, and then we processed it under three extrusion profiles. And those are designated here as low, moderate, or severe SME. And SME stands for specific mechanical energy, which is a calculated value we can use to estimate the amount of mechanical forces or shear forces that uh, are resulting from the, the rotating screw coming into contact with the material. And what these profiles were aimed at was to not only affect specific mechanical energy, but also the thermal stress that the organism would be exposed to. So as you can see here, the dye temperature increases as we moved through the profiles. And for our results here, what we found is that the extrusion parameters did have an impact on the survival of the organism. What's shown here on the x-axis is the sampling points where we started with sampling in the raw base ration followed by off the extruder and then off the dryer. And on the y-axis is our surviving cells after log transformation. So we tend to work with logs and microbial data just because those numbers are so big. And so if you follow the blue bars here, which I've highlighted, those are the low extrusion profile, which was meant to have the least stress on the organism. We saw less than one log reduction from start to finish. But for the moderate and severe extrusion profiles, we saw a really big drop in viability, and that was between two to three logs on average. And that biggest drop was happening here as it moved from the base ration to the extrusion. In order to understand a little bit more about the relationship between certain variables uh, that we were changing during extrusion and survival of the organism, we also looked at correlations, um, specifically with extruder water input. So if we focus on the graph here on the left, as we increased extruder water input from 10 to 20 kilograms per hour, we saw that survival of the organism increased, and this was a strong positive relationship. And the opposite effect was true for extruder screw speed, which is shown here on the right. As we increased from 400 to 600 rotations per minute, we saw a strong negative uh, correlation to the survival of the organism. And aside from extrusion parameters, we also wanted to look at different drying conditions because all pet foods need to be dried to a certain moisture level in order to uh, prolong their shelf life and prevent growth of spoilage microorganisms. And so what we did is we processed it under three dryer profiles, which are long temperature, low time, moderate temperature, moderate time, and high temp and short time combinations. And after analyzing the results, we did not see a significant impact of the dryer conditions. 
However, we did find more variability in the low temperature long time, which was somewhat surprising considering you would expect more uh, survival to be lost through a high temperature condition. So this tells us that the efficiency of process might be improved by having shorter time, higher temperature settings when using a probiotic in the base ration. And then to answer our second question about the benefits of the probiotic for gastrointestinal health of dogs, excuse me, uh, we ran a feeding study that used 10 healthy adult beagle dogs, and this study ran for a duration of 105 days. Those 105 days were split into five periods of 21 days total, where it was 16 days of adaptation to each dietary treatment, followed by five days of total fecal collection. The diets that we fed were formulated to be grain-free carbohydrate sources, so I've highlighted those over here, as well as a high crude protein level, which was nearly 35% crude protein. And we chose that type of diet because that mimics exactly uh, the type of food you might find probiotics in stores today. The dietary treatments were designed to either have no probiotic in them, to have some probiotic that had been passed through the extruder and heat processed, as well as three uh, probiotic treatments that had the probiotic coated on the exterior of the kibble at increasing doses. And so for the animal at the, uh, the amount of food that they consumed, uh, we had a probiotic dose ranging from about 2 million all the way up to 1 billion CFU per day. And so what we looked at first was stool quality, which is one of those benefits that's been reported for other probiotics. And we did not find any changes in their fecal quality. And we looked at this through fecal output, so the amount of feces they produced, their, excuse me, the fecal moisture content and the defecations per day and the fecal score. This wasn't so surprising to us only because these dogs were producing good stool quality at the start of the study. So um, it's hard to improve when it's already good, but they did maintain that stool quality. And then we also looked at apparent total tract digestibility of dogs with the different levels of bacillus coagulants. So you can see our treatments here moving across as the probiotic dose increases. And we did see some improvements here specifically to dry matter, organic matter, ash, and gross energy digestibility for the highest dose treatment in comparison to the control. We also tended to see that protein digestibility increased as the coated treatments increased in dose. However, those results were not significant compared to the control. And finally, we looked at different microbial end products, which tells us a little bit about the activities that might be happening inside the gut. And so we look at fecal pH, fecal ammonia production, and volatile fatty acids that can be produced through microbial fermentation. And we did not find any differences there. Um, and this was surprising to us given that bacillus coagulans is a lactic acid producing bacterium. However, we think this might have been more related to the diet that we used, which being grain free, it brought in with it a lot of fermentable substrates, and that could influence the activities of the resident microbiota, which well outnumber the probiotic that we added in here. So in conclusion, Bacillus coagulans GBI-30-6086 did survive extrusion under the settings that we looked at in this study. And we can expect a two to three log reduction under a moderate extrusion condition. But we would recommend that viability validation be performed, especially for different facilities with different equipment configurations or even different formula compositions. And we didn't find that the dryer had much of an effect on the survival of the probiotic. And then as far as the benefits, there were some apparent digestibility enhancements with the use of the probiotic for the highest dose. However, we didn't see any differences in some of the other parameters that other probiotics might be able to provide. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that all of this research was funded by Cary Incorporated. And I've also included a list of references here in case any of you are interested in additional reading. So this is available in your handout. Thank you very much, and I'll be available for questions on this topic towards the end of our webinar today. Thank you, Heather. And as you mentioned, we'll be holding our questions to the end so you can so that we can stay on track. So please continue to submit your questions to the questions box on the control panel. Our next speaker is Christina Lima. Christina is from Ecuador. She is a master's student in the pet food program in the Department of Grain Science and Industry at Kansas State University. Her research focused on the development of new pet treats utilizing soluble animal proteins to mimic the functionality of gluten when wheat was replaced by sorghum. Christina has a bachelor's in food science and technology at the Pan American Agriculture School uh, Zamorano in Honduras. 
Additionally, she worked as a formulator at Scredding Ecuador, where she developed and optimized formulations for shrimp, tilapia, and trout. Christina is passionate about companion animals and working for their well-being and health. Christina, take it away. Thank you for that nice introduction. And um, welcome everybody to this webinar. I'm pleased to uh, share with you part of my research, which is supplementation of gluten-free, sorghum flour-based petris with soluble animal proteins. As an introduction, we all know that petrits are extensively provided to our animals, especially as a means of pampering and also to reinforce positive behaviors. They are not intended to meet the complete nutritional needs of the dogs or cats, and they should not be provided in quantities higher than 10% of their daily energy requirements. This segment is in a growing condition, and the market projection for this year is expected to reach $31.37 billion. Within this pet treats category, we have crunchy treats, which are one of the oldest but more commercialized uh, categories in these pet treats, and they are um, characterized by having a heart tissue, which is associated with dental benefits and reduction of a uh, buildup of calculus and teeth. The main ingredient usually uh, utilized in this product is cereal, and nowadays basically wheat. It is because it has gluten properties that confer good uh, structurability, but also harness to the product. Uh, there are different shaping technologies, uh, but today I will focus on rotary molder. This is a rotary molder, which have a hopper where you can actually place the dough and it will be transferred and forced to two different rolls. The forcing roll that will exert some pressure on the, on the dough and the molding roll that has some engravement so the product can be shaped. After rotary halfway through, it will be released in this extraction web uh, for further breaking. An important characteristic of these products is that they are performed with uh, this type of dough. It is a firm and crumbling consistency and it has not developed gluten. Instead, it is like a slightly cohesiveness, so it can be shaped, but it is not sticky. Uh, even when wheat has been widely used, nowadays there are other gluten-free uh, alternatives of cereal which are intended to be uh, evaluated. One of them is sorghum, which is the globally fifth most produced cereal. It has environmental and nutritional benefits such as resilient, sustainable, and tolerant to high temperatures and drought. It is a rich source of dietary fiber, resistant starch, B vitamins, and antioxidants in all its compounds. It also has a slow start digestibility, which is beneficial to population with high levels of glucose or also with obesity. And as I mentioned, it's a natural gluten-free cereal which can be used in products, uh, especially for products uh, for uh, consumers that are compromised with uh, gluten sensitivity. Sorghum has been increasingly utilized in pet products, pet products. However, its market share is still low, with only 2% of its consumption. However, because sorghum does not have gluten, it has some processability disadvantages. For this reason, proteins can be included in this type of product as they can provide dough enhancement, amino acid enrichment, and also they, they can generate the tidy effect. Dogs can utilize either vegetable or animal proteins. However, animal proteins can be thought as more palatable sources as they have better olfactory properties. Within this category, spray dry plasma, egg whites, and gelatin have been widely utilized in different products because they contain uh, high levels of seroalbumin, ovalbumin, and collagen, respectively. So based on research, they have good water binding ability, gelling strength, and also emulsifying properties, which translate in improvements of texture and also maintaining high degree of cohesiveness uh, between the ingredients, especially when they are cooked. With this background, we uh, have two main research questions. The first one, can we produce a rotary molded sorghum based treat with the same characteristics as a wheat based product? And can the addition of proteins emulate the response of gluten? 
For this purpose, we elaborate nine different treatments. The first one, a WWF and VPN, represents a whole wheat flour with gluten. The four next treatments represent whole white sorghum with no protein included, spray dry plasma, egg protein, or gelatin. And the next four treatments represent whole red sorghum uh, with the same proteins included. So even when at the beginning of the experiment with them, we wanted them to be isonitrogenous, it, we realized during the preliminary trial that not all proteins became the same way. So the uh, inclusion of the proteins uh, varied among them. As I'm highlighting here, the egg protein has the highest dose, so they have a comparable uh, dose consistency and also the products could be released from the rotary molder. And in addition to these uh, ingredients I'm showing in the main chart, we have other ingredients with a content around 12.5% of the total formulation. Uh, in addition, water was added on top of the other ingredients to uh, help us obtain similar consistency of the dough. It is important highlighting in this trial that for the negative control, which did not include any protein, we could not uh, shape them in the rotary molder. And instead, with them, uh, we shape them manually uh, by uh, sheeting and cutting. So higher amount of water were included. And so with that, we obtained this kind of, kind of products. This is the positive control with width, and this is the white sorghum and the red sorghum. And as you can see here, the negative control looks a little bit different, but at least we have some products to measure the remaining effect and see how proteins can affect and improve the consistency of the products. So for the methods, we perform a texture analysis with a texture analyzer in which we measure hardness and fracturability. A dimension analysis with a digital caliper where we measure the length, the width of the body and tip of the, of the biscuit, the thickness and the weight. Also, we did a color analysis where we determined the values of A, A and B. And finally, I will be talking about an animal evaluation in which we use 12 bigot dogs. This was conducted in four different phases, which by day length each. It was an acclimation phase with commercial treats. Then we uh, offer the dogs white sorghum treats and compare them to the control. And then we move to the red sorghum treats and compare to the control. And finally, we selected based on the previous evaluation, which white sorghum and red sorghum treats we wanted to compare to the control. Moving into the results, here we have the uh, texture attributes for the large size big treats. And we did see that an improvement on the texture when we included the protein. So the highest texture was obtained uh, with the egg protein treatment, followed by the spray dry plasma, uh, the gelatin, and finally the negative control treatment. Similarly, in the fracturability, which is the distance the, the probe travels until it bends the product, we, we obtain similar values to the hardness, like similar trends where the positive control and egg protein treatment have the higher values. Moving into the color, we did find that the L values, which is the lightness of the product, was affected by the protein and also the uh, cereal use. So the higher, the lowest values, which mean darker products were obtained with the egg protein treatment and also with the spray dry plasma, especially when a uh, red sorghum uh, was utilized. When we compared the A values, which is the redness use of the product, we did observe a uh, effect of the cereal, but also as the protein. So reddish products were obtained with red sorghum uh, pericarp, and also as a reaction of mylar, higher values were obtained when a protein was combined to this product. Uh, when comparing the B value, which is actually the yellowness of the products, uh, it was also influenced by the pericarp of the cereal use. 
So higher values were obtained in the width or also white turbo increment. For the dimensions, here I have the, the main effect of crossing only. And as, as you can see, all the first bar have an asterisk in red. And I am not considering this the negative control because they were manually shaped. So they it did have different uh, measurements. However, when comparing the length, width body, and width tips of the products, the gelatin have higher values as compared to the other treatments. When comparing the thickness, the positive control has the highest variance and it was attributed partially to the gluten of the products. Uh, when comparing the weight, we did only observe differences between the positive control and spray dry uh, and egg protein treatment, which has higher value, a lower value, I'm sorry, but the other did not differ. In this chart, we can see the rank order of reference of the treats. Um, actually, in this table, we are only presenting 10, 10 values of values of only 10 dogs because two of them did not finish the trial. Uh, this is an ordinal data. So higher values actually means less, less preferred treatment. So we did find differences uh, when we evaluate white carbon treatment to the control, uh, where egg protein, spray dry plasma, and also the positive control were higher preferred and equally preferred than gelatin or the negative control. We did not observe differences in the red carbon evaluation. And for the last evaluation, we decided to perform spray dry plasma and gelatin as compared to the control. And it was basically did because this product had more similar um, protein levels. And also we found out that the, the dogs had some problems eating the protein treatment because of the hard detections. However, we did not find differences in the last evaluation. As a conclusion, the texture of the sorghum treatments was significantly enhanced by the action of the protein included, where the egg protein had higher values. The proteins included, especially uh, the egg protein and spray dry plasma, created darker products, especially after breaking, as a reaction of mylar uh, occurring in this process. And the document did not detect differences between the positive control, white sorghum, or red sorghum treatments when they were evaluated together. However, it was found some trouble when needed the protein treatment that was per se. Uh, I want to thank you for listening to this short presentation, and I will be happy to take any questions at the end of this uh, session. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christina. Our final presentation for today is from Amanda Dayton. Amanda is a PhD candidate in the Department of Grain Science and Industry at Kansas State University. She specializes in the production of pet food and her research addresses common quality concerns with canned pet food. These challenges include carbo uh, carbohydrate hydrocolloids, uh, copper supplementation, and thiamine degradation. Amanda is a bachelor of, has a Bachelor of Science in Feed Science and Management from Kansas State University and a Master's of Science in Nutritional Sciences with an emphasis on companion animals from the University of Illinois. In addition, she has interned for three different top 20 pet food companies in quality, engineering, and R&D roles. We'll now hear from Amanda. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you so much to Balcam for allowing me to pre-record my presentation today, as I wasn't <laughs> unable to join you all in this webinar. So first, we're going to give a brief introduction to carbohydrate hydrocolloids. These are ingredients included in wet pet food formulations to provide either structure to the product after it's been processed, or to aid in supporting the filling viscosity before we put our food products into cans. These carbohydrate hydrocolloid ingredients are very commonly referred to as gums or gels, but for today's presentation, I'm going to call them a carbohydrate hydrocolloid. We've seen a few papers looking at the influence of these ingredients on nutrient digestibility when fed to dogs and cats. Some of the big takeaways are that adding in a carbohydrate hydrocolloid can decrease crude protein digestibility, and there is some conflicting research on its effects on stool quality. 
Some papers have found that fuel quality becomes softer, whereas others have found that fuel quality becomes firmer. However, we don't see any research papers in uh, the functional effects that these ingredients provide to the food product itself. There is some information from human food research, uh, specifically looking at sausage production, uh, but the way sausages are produced is very different from the way that canned foods are produced. So sometimes the conclusions drawn from those studies are not directly transferable to what we have in canned foods. So our hypothesis for this presentation today was we felt that the different combinations of carbohydrate hydrocolloids would thicken batter, decrease heat penetration, and alter the color and texture of canned or wet pet foods. So our objective was to determine and quantify the effects these ingredients have specifically on batter development, heat penetration, color, and the texture of our finished product. I'll first begin explaining our experimental treatments. And for the sake of time, I'm just gonna focus on the ingredients that were different, which are listed here in this first column with the subsequent columns showing our different treatments. Our very first treatment represented by the letter D contained 1% dextrose and was included in the treatment structure as a negative control that did not contain any carbohydrate hydrocolloids. Our next treatment, designated by DG, contained a half percentage of dextrose and a half percentage of gorgum. This treatment was very specifically included in the structure because pet food companies had started to use, uh, started to replace our different carbohydrate hydrocolloids with other ingredients as a way to differentiate their products from their competitors. But Guargum has given these companies a particular challenge, and they haven't been able to find a good replacement for it. So it was important for us to know the effects of Guargum at this half percentage level uh, on our finished product and better characteristics. The three remaining treatments all still had this half percentage of Guargum, but had either a half percent of capicaragenin, a half percent of locustine gum, or a half percent of xanthan gum. And we wanted to include these treatments because capicaragenin, locustine gum, and xanthan gum all have different chemical structures that drive the mechanisms they employ when included in a wet pet food. So it was important for us to be able to see the similarities and differences in how these ingredients performed in the product, see if they uh, had similar or different effects. Very briefly, our treatments were produced by first uh, mixing chicken and water and heating that mixture to 40 degrees Celsius, at which point our brewer's rice, spray dried egg white, sunflower oil, potassium chloride, and vitamin and trace mineral premixes were added to the batter, which was then heated to 60 degrees Celsius. At that time, our differentiating ingredients, so our dextrose and our carbohydrate hydrocolloids, were added to the batter and mixed for five minutes to ensure an even distribution and development of our batter characteristics. At that point, the batters were then uh, filled into cans with approximately 405 grams and lids were steamed on. These cans were held in water baths until all treatments had been produced to help maintain that internal can temperature. During this uh, batter development and can filling process, we took quite a few different measurements. Uh, first, we looked at batter consistency using the phosphate consistometer pictured here on the top right. This gave us an indication of viscosity as uh, the phosphate consistometer is affected by viscosity, but also surface tension and specific gravity. Additionally, we also measured the pH and water activity of our batters before retort processing. While filling cans, we recorded the can fill weight of select cans and also measured the growth head space, which I've included a diagram of that right here in the middle. The growth head space is the difference uh, the distance between the top of the can and the top of the food product inside that can. Finally, we also measured the internal cold spot temperature of our food product using a thermocouple setup. I pictured an example here on the bottom right where this thermocouple needle uh, reaches the center of the product and is able to record temperature at specific intervals. These uh, temperature and time data that we collected were used to calculate the estivo value and the cook value. Both of these values were calculated using this equation here, which takes into account the different time intervals and the internal temperature of the can at each of those time intervals and sums them up for the entire process. 
It also incorporates two uh, reference values, the PR and Z value, uh, which I've shown here on this table on the bottom, where we've got the items uh, that were our reference values, uh, as well as our item of concern for each of our F of O value and our cook value. So for the F of O value, we're specifically looking at Clostridium botulinum for our reference values. Clostridium botulinum is our publicly significant health uh, microorganism uh, that can produce neurotoxins that are deadly to humans if consumed. So we want to make sure that we're processing the food to a level to reduce uh, the levels of Clostridium botulinum. For the cook value, we're looking at thiamine as our item of concern. And we're specifically looking at thiamine because this nutrient is easily degraded during processing. So it's important for us to be able to understand the nutritional effects that could be occurring uh, due to our processing methods. So our TR value is our reference temperature for each of our items of concern. For Clostridium botulinum, it's about 121 degrees Celsius. And for thiamine, it's 100 degrees Celsius. Z the Z value is looking at the temperature change that's required to see a one log reduction in our Z value. And for uh, the F of O value, that is going to be 10 degrees Celsius. And for the cook value, that's going to be 33 degrees Celsius. The last uh, type of analysis we did on our uh, product was looking at the CIE LAB color space value using a conica minolta colorimeter. And I pictured a, uh, an image over on the right side of this color space system where we have three different parameters that describe color. So the first is L star, representing lightness or darkness, where values closer to 100 are lighter or whiter, and values closer to zero are blacker or darker. The A, green, the A star scale looks at the red-green scale of color, pictures right here. So more positive A star values are redder products and the more negative A star values represent greener products. The final scale is the B star value, representing yellows and blues. And the more positive your B star value is, the yellower your product is. The more negative your B star value is, the bluer it is. And we were able to take uh, measurements of the color in five different cross-sectional areas of our canned product to ensure that we understood the entire color of the product, going from the top all the way to the bottom of the can. Very briefly, our data were analyzed as a randomized complete block design with effects effective treatment and the random effective production day. We did a one-way analysis of variance with a mean separation using the Fisher's least significant difference, and p-values less than 0 0.005 were considered significant. Now moving into results, uh, this slide is showing our batter consistency and other batter characteristics. And for all subsequent charts, they're going to appear very similar to this one here, where our treatments are shown on the x-axis, and the y-axis shows batter consistency, um, or would see any other metrics being shown in that chart. So here we're seeing batter consistency expressed in terms of centimeters traveled in a set time of 30 seconds. So here we would say that samples that travel a farther distance have thinner consistency, whereas a sample that doesn't travel very far in that 30 seconds has a thicker consistency. Right off the bat, we can see that our 1% dextrose treatment that had no carbohydrate hydrocholate had the thinnest consistency as it traveled the farthest in 30 seconds. The addition of a half percent guar gum did provide some thickening power to our product. And when we add in another carbohydrate hydrocholate for a total percentage of 1%, we see a further thickening, but we don't see any differences in our, uh, between the different carbohydrate hydrocholates. This would suggest to us that the percentage or the total amount of carbohydrate hydrocholates is what drives better consistency in this experiment. And uh, the different types of carbohydrate hydrocholates have less of an impact. Briefly, we also, as I mentioned, we did look at pH and water activity. And these were not different from each other, an average of pH of 5.94 and a water activity of 9. Uh, excuse me, 0 0.99 respectively. The next parameter we looked at was heat penetration during the heating cycle, uh, which on this slide I've expressed on the chart in terms of the heating cycle X of O accumulation during a set processing time expressed in minutes. And while this is not the typical way that heat penetration is analyzed uh, in foods, we can say that because the foods were processed for the same amount of time, samples that accumulated greater X of O values 
may have uh, faster heat penetration rates than those that accumulate lower amounts of estrogen value. So right away we see that our treatment with 1% dextrose that contains no carbohydrate hydrocolloids accumulated the most estrogen value in that same processing time, with no differences observed between any of the remaining treatments. So this suggests to us that once we thicken that batter to at least uh, six point, or at the most 6.6 .6 centimeters per 30 seconds travel, uh, we do see a decrease in heat penetration. This could uh, provide some benefit to the pet food company. If they're able to generate batters that have a thinner consistency, they may be able to reduce the processing time in the retort and allow them to produce more cans overall in the same amount of time without needing to make a large capital investment. And though I didn't show a chart looking at cook values during this heating cycle, we do see the exact same relationship, where our D treatment with that 1% dextrose accumulated the highest cook value, approximately 137 minutes. And the average of all other treatments was around 117 and a quarter minutes of time. Next, we'll look at color. And just to orient you to this table, we do have our different treatments expressed in the columns with a pooled standard error of the mean and a p-value. And our rows represent the three different colors of parameter, or three different parameters of color, with our different colors uh, being visible on these images where we've got the different treatments in the same order from left to right as they appear in the table. So we'll first begin with L-star. And we can generally see that when we have uh, higher levels of dextrose, we have uh, lower ELSTER values representing darker products with really no differences exhibited in our treatments that contain 1% total carbohydrate hydrocolloids. And very similar trends are seen both in A star and B star, where when we add dextrose into the formula, we have redder and yellower products represented by higher A star and B star values. Uh, and all of our treatments that contain a total of 1% carbohydrate hydrocolloids had very similar levels of red and yellow hues. And you can see this looking at this image in the bottom, where the first two pictures show us our D and DG treatments that contain dextrose, and they are very visibly different in color compared to our three other treatments. So we know that carbohydrate hydrocolloids have very few interactions that result in color changes. So the, the lack of differences seen in these three treatments was not unexpected. However, we were not expecting such low levels of dextrose to result in such high changes in color. So moving forward, if we wanted to do an experiment where color was an important parameter, we would not want to use dextrose as a control ingredient. And unfortunately, today I'm not able to present uh, any of our analytical texture data. However, uh, while we're on this slide and we can visually see the products, I hope you all can see that there are visual differences in how, what these products look like in terms of texture. Our 1% dextrose treatment had a very sloppy texture. Uh, we actually see a phase separation where some of our liquid separates from the solid food particle sample. When we add in a half percent of dextrose, we no longer see that phase separation, but we still don't have a very strong texture to help us maintain uh, the structure of the food after it's removed from the can. And our three treatments that contain 1% carbohydrate hydrocolate as a total do still have that strong texture, and they do still look like they would form the shape of the can if we had kept these slices all stacked on top of each other. So we might see that this capitara gene and gorgum treatment in the middle looks more circular and didn't spread as much as our locustine gum gorgum and xanthan gum gorgum treatment. So the conclusions from this experiment are that carbohydrate hydrocolloids do thicken batters, slow heat penetration, and provide structure and finished products. And we also saw that dextrose does affect product, affect product color by darkening and increasing the red and yellow hues. For future work, uh, our lab has looked at doing texture analysis on these products, as well as analyzing them for their expressible moisture. Uh, both of these techniques are very new to uh, companion animal wet pet food diets, uh, and we're hoping to present this data at a conference this summer. But overall, our lab is very interested in evaluating novel gums and gels, as well as other functional ingredients in wet pet foods. Now that we have a baseline or a better understanding of how these ingredients influence product characteristics. So with that, I do want to thank my advisor, Dr. Greg Aldrich, as well as the entire Kansas State University Pet Food Processing Laboratory 
for helping with diet production and processing data collection. It would not have been possible without their assistance. And with that, I'm happy to turn the webinar back over to the organizers. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you to the entire uh, uh, research team from K-State. The future looks uh, bright indeed with this new crop of young scientists. Before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. At Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health, we strive every day to deliver results you can see in your animal's productivity and your bottom line. From a smooth transition into the milking string for your fresh cows, to a happy welcome home from your furry friend. From a strong start in your poultry flock, to consistent weight gains for your finishing hogs. We expect to earn your business and your trust with our people, our products, and our science. Our people have an intense passion for your animals and your success. You can count on us for honest, candid advice and practical solutions for your toughest challenges. As the global leader in choline production, chelation, and encapsulation technology, we take our obligation to you and to the environment seriously. Our products are backed by the most extensive and thorough research portfolio while our business is committed to advancing environmental sustainability and animal welfare. In the end, it all comes down to results. Balchem delivers real results you can count on, results that exceed your expectations, and results that bring true value to your bottom line. Leading the charge to meet the nutritional needs of ruminants, monogastrics, and companion animals, Balchem offers a growing portfolio of nutritional products and a dedication to innovation and industry sustainability. Balchem is here to solve today and shape tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Aldrich, why don't we start with you to give just a, a brief summary of what we saw today? Hello, Scott, and thank you. Um, so what you have seen is a, a snapshot, a brief sampling of some of the research that we've been doing in the laboratory here at K-State. Um, it covers all of the facets of pet food manufacturing from extrusion, as you saw in Heather's work, to baking that you uh, experienced with Christina and canned or wet pet food production uh, that you uh, were able to see with uh, Amanda's work. And so the idea here is, is that we're working across a, a variety of platforms in the pet food industry. And as such, uh, from the food side of the equation, we have to understand the various aspects of how the process influences the visual, the organoleptic, um, and even the nutritional aspects of those food products that we deliver into the pet food industry. So uh, we're working in those areas as well as the food safety. So we have a microbiology lab that also is uh, looking at food additives and other intervention strategies to mitigate uh, pathogens in our food products. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, we'll start with our questions. First one, uh, we'll start with Heather. Um, are there any advantages to including probiotics in pet food or treats rather than just supplementing it on the side, such as an, a, a capsule? That's a great question. And, you know, it's it's one that's, I think, really important because it, it begs the question of why are we putting it in pet foods if we could just give it to them on the side? And one of the keys to probiotics is daily administration. Uh, most probiotic strains that are being given to animals are what are called transient probiotics. They're not taking up residence, which means that they're simply passing through. And as they do that, they're providing all those benefits. So by giving it in the food, that's a multi-day or single day dose that the pet owner would be able to give. And the other side of that is compliance. If you're feeding them to elicit that benefit to the animal and the owner has to remember to give a capsule per day, I think the veterinarians, if there's any in the audience, will agree that getting owners to comply with providing some sort of instruction where they have to do something that's different out of their routine is really, really difficult. So by putting it in the food, we're making sure the animal gets the dose with every meal. 
Uh, thank you, Heather. The next one uh, is for Christina. Uh, based on your findings, which of the proteins, uh, which of the proteins would you recommend to use as a better substitute of gluten in a commercial setting? Thank you for that question. Actually, that's very important to like to conclude after all, all our findings. So I would say, uh, based on our uh, observation, I would say is spray gray plasma. I I had not the opportunity to present all our data. But based on the data I present you today and also the other data of the nutritional composition and all this, spray dry plasma behave better or better resemble to the wheat products. Um, even when the hardness was not like the higher or more comparable, it was an intermediate value. So we can move from there and actually get like a optimal inclusion level. But I would say we can get in deep. Um, um like get deeper uh, knowledge and do more research with these with these person all right thank you christina thank you dr aldrich the next question is for amanda but i understand she's not able to join us today is she's on a a job interview is that right that's right and by the way all three of these ladies are either finished or finishing uh, heather will defend on monday uh, Christina and Amanda have both defended their master's thesis and PhD dissertations, and uh, Christina and uh, Amanda are actually in the job hunt. So anybody out there listening, here's some talent. Absolutely. Top end talent as, as well. Um, so here's a question for Amanda, and you're going to be subbing in for why was guar gum included in nearly all treatments? Yeah, so that's... Uh, you know, if you look at the experimental design, you'd say, well, why didn't you do these all as individuals? Well, one of the challenges is we use guar gum as a stabilizer pre-retort. So it gives us some thickness. And so in general, what we'll see is, is that guar gum would be used in combination with the other two or three uh, hydrocolloids that were evaluated, the carrageenan, xanthan, and locust bean gum. And so by removing it, uh, it well, or by 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 difference, uh, we need to establish what it would be like without the without those uh, the gelling agents, the locust bean gum, guar gum, xanthan gum, and so it gave us another baseline. So in essence, including the guar gum by itself was our baseline or a second control besides our negative control. All right, thank you. Now while you've got the floor, I've got a kind of a program question here for you. Um, a, a wide, wide range of students uh, have interest in companion animal nutrition, but pet food nutrition is not a traditional discipline in animal science programs. What have been some of the, challenge you, the challenges you have faced when starting this program, and what have been some of the top benefits of starting the program? Yeah, so um, I don't know if I can address it in both those orders. I would I share with you that we are in the grain science and industry department, which uh, has three uh, undergraduate degrees and a grain science and industry or grain science graduate degree. The three undergraduate degrees are baking science, milling science, and feed science. And our pet food program is housed within the feed science and management degree, uh, which means that we're separate from uh, the animal science department in regards to uh, just pure animal research for uh, the nutritional physiology, reproductive kinds of things. And we're also separate from food science. So we kind of have our own little niche here, which actually gives us some latitude to try some new things. And uh, uh, we also are able to rely upon our uh, colleagues in the grain sciences both milling and the baking area to complement some of our capabilities. So in a way, what we have here is an animal food science program, um, both for livestock feed and for companion animals. So one of the big challenges is that it's uh, kind of a one of a kind for the moment. I know some of the other universities are adapting and adding some food processing capabilities to their programs as well, and that's great. But uh, when you're out on your own, um, getting recognition and awareness of the program for recruiting, for funding and those sorts of things is a bit of a challenge. We're also kind of navigating some new uh, worlds here in terms of the academic institution and its recognition and, and uh, 
the notion of whether or not it should or should not exist as a separate degree program. And so um, in a way, it's, it's giving us a lot of latitude to create and, and learn as we build the program, but also we're having to do things that uh, most traditional academics may not have to do, and, and that's get out and build awareness both on campus and out in the industry. I think the net net though is, is that we're training some young people that uh, as, a, as a prior industry professional working with pet food companies, uh, this was a gap that I foresaw. And uh, I think what we're doing is training young people to fill in that gap between the food engineering and um, the hardcore nutritional sciences. Uh, and that is at the food level where we're delivering those nutrients, but we have to assure that we are able to do that on a routine basis um, effectively. Uh, thank you for that nice overview. Next question is for Heather and comes from Christian. How was the temperature measured in the extrusion process and where were the measurements taken at the barrel, extra date, et cetera? That's a great question. We actually had a thermocouple with a probe that in, was inserted right at the tip of the die exit. So as the material was flowing from the extruder and entering the die landing area, that's where the thermocouple probe was. So it metered intervals at 30 minute time frames. We would take those readings off of the control panels as well as off of any uh, manual gauges like the pressure gauges and things that didn't have a, a reading out on the, the output. All right, thank you, Heather. And Christina, uh, can this work be transferable when using other cereal ingredients, let's say like corn, rice, and other gluten-free cereals? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for that question. Actually, what, that was one of the objectives of this study. So we decided to use cor uh, sorghum, as I mentioned, it has a, a wide uh, benefit. But there are other gluten-free grains that can actually be transferable with this knowledge we were able to collect. And actually, that's very nice Like to also try these proteins, how they behave. But actually, they will improve considerably the processability. Thank you for that question. Oh, you're very welcome. I see now that we're uh, nearing the top of the hour, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll bring it to a close here. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Aldrich, Christina, Amanda, mm -hmm. Heather, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll forward them along with the unanswered questions uh, from today's session. Our next Companion Animal webinar will be on April 20th when we hear from Dr. Uh, Androni Verbruggen from the University of Guelph. She will share new research into mitigating feline obesity. We have two other webinars coming up in the next few weeks. On March 23rd, Dr. Manuel Borca from the USDA will review the newest updates on an African swine fever vaccine. And on April 6th, Dr. Mike McCluskey will discuss how the dairy industry is working toward net zero carbon emissions. Visit balchemanh.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. We now have 10 episodes on YouTube, your favorite podcast platform, and also at balchemanh.com slash podcast. We go behind the scenes to hear the conversations that take place over a few drinks with friends. Search for Real Science Exchange on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to subscribe. On behalf of Balchem and K-State Pet Food Program, thank you for joining us today.